she is a standout, brilliant, a brilliant woman. And I just got, whoa, this woman is amazing. Why don't I know about her? And I couldn't believe that I was living in a town where such an important person lived and worked and made change happen that then allowed me to be the woman I am today. She and the other women like her were saying, actually, no, we're going to change this. Because they're a very privileged family, she didn't need to bother, really. She had all the opportunities that other people didn't, but she fought for other people to get them as well. And that we don't know. It's like, we, this woman's been overlooked, forgotten, like so, so many women. It's, it's a classic, isn't it? It's a classic of the untold story. Please allow me to introduce myself. I am Stroud's secret suffragist. stumbled into Chazia's local history blogging and Stroud Local History Society. So some of it's been about this man has spent a lot of time on this. This really does deserve a good public hearing. Because where I started from was finding out about what she'd been doing working uh, as a councillor in Stroud because there wasn't any, she didn't have a wiki, a Wikipedia entry. So together with Jackie and Chas, we had a whole day where we uh, added um, all the information we could uh, find and verify. And now there's actually quite a big entry on Margaret Hills. And it's like he was really wanting to find a way of commemorating her with, I don't know, you know, a statue or a plaque or a this or a that. And I'm not quite sure where the idea came from, but I said to Kim, would she be interested in doing a street performance? And she said, yes, if you write the script. I had never written a script before. It's quite a daunting prospect because it feels quite a big project and I feel very responsible for bringing her to life. But immensely privileged to be asked to do this. I feel very, very strongly that the people of Stroud should hear about her. And that's what that day is about, really, is about people of Stroud realising that what this woman did. I am Stroud's secret suffragist. <laughs> Mrs. Margaret Hills. Even the sort of the opportunities she had in terms of education, in terms of going to uni university. I mean, one of the first things that stuck into my mind was the fact that she went to university but wasn't allowed to have a certificate proving that get a first and then not have a degree certificate, that's just awful. Because there were all these women who were passing these degrees, getting great results, and no bits of paper for it. Well, that fury spurred me on. No better way to deal with it than use it as fuel for fire. You know, she was really encouraging about particularly uh, women being involved in education in a much bigger way than had been the case previously. She was a, a middle-class woman, educated woman, really acting on behalf of uh, those who were less privileged than her. To make use of the privilege she had. She didn't need to bother really. She had all the opportunities that other people didn't, but she fought for other people to get them as well. Here in Manchester, where I had moved to in 1908 to become a suffrage organiser, where I first met Mrs. Millicent Fawcett, I was asked to become one of three national organisers for the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies. Millicent Fawcett organised them into the National Union that then she handpicked Margaret. She's networking with you know different people of different classes. 
you know, doing drawing room meetings. She's also doing factory gate lunchtime speeches um, to working people. So this is somebody who's making a connection, of course, right across the spectrum. Her ability to speak to anybody, engage with anybody, that's how she did a lot of her networking, just by chatting to people and being, being available. And I like that because I like talking to people. Having somebody who we can associate with locally who was part of a progressive movement at a time when the ideas of that group were largely seen as radical, that model is always relevant. She and the other women like her were saying, actually, no, we're going to change this. So they were changing it around education. They were changing it around medicine. They were changing it around birth control. It's brilliant. But despite our local successes, we, suffragists and suffragettes, were failing to make national headway with our MPs and our Prime Minister in particular. We had suffragettes and suffragists. The suffragettes, so the colours that I think at this point more women um, and people recognise. So there are people who want to be really angry and to channel that anger into argumentation and debate um, to push things more quickly. Out of frustration that it's been years and years of gender-based discrimination. And then there are other women who are less comfortable with that and they want to act in ways that are within the constraints of society but still really clearly making their views heard. These are the colours of the suffragists. We have suffragists saying that actually we can do this without violence. Great progress was, was made by the suffragists and the foundations of the movement were, were substantiated um, by, by those women. It's the suffragette colours, the purple, the dark green and the white, that are being used this year as the colours of suffrage. And that, if you like, this red and green and white, that was the suffragist colours, have gone into the background and, uh, and I'm annoyed at that because the suffragists were campaigning from 1866. It's a slowly, slowly catchy monkey approach, you know, peaceful persuasion, hearts and minds work, hearts and minds work, um, and that this woman was part of. We're, we're forgetting that, we're overlooking that and noticing the direct action, often violent acts, because those captured the press, as they do now. So there's a, I think there's still a very live debate about direct action and its limits, and peaceful, slow, constitutional change. Ultimately, what's important is that it was the, the actions of both groups together making the swell, the groundswell of, of change that then kind of propelled us forward. What she teaches us that it's possible to, to be disobedient without being violent. So Mrs. Fawcett decided another pilgrimage was needed from all compass points in the country to reach London as a mass showing of public opinion. Groups progressed and organised themselves from Cornwall to Cheltenham, Oxford, Wales, and even Stroud. Yay! They were on the road for six weeks or whatever. Their caravans were set on light. When they were speaking, they had rotten tomatoes, rotten eggs, stones thrown at them, everything. <laughs> Would that these were all that were thrown at us? <laughs> Cabbages hurt. The, the model of, of demonstration, huge mass demonstrations, making an impact in the streets was something that was pioneered by, by the suffragists. Some of these actions were really, they were artistic and, and inspiring. Um, and that's how I think the radical then becomes attractive to the people who don't define themselves as radical. And then you get a mass movement and then you get change. Then in 1913, I met Harold. <laughs> Meanwhile, the international situation had worsened. There was now no hope for peace. There would be no general election, but world war. Harold and I married on the 6th of August 1914 at Hampstead Registry Office.
Within hours, Howard had gone to Aldershot Barracks as an officer doctor in the Royal Army Medical Corps. Nine days later, he left England. Now, her husband was uh, a member of the Territorial Royal Army Medical Corps. There's a very small amount of correspondence uh, between them in the records office at Gloucester. And you get this real sense of, even though it's sort of military postcards, you get the sense of a very close uh, relationship between the, between the two of them. So you have the, the, all of the conflicts about being separated by distance, not knowing whether somebody's alive or dead. And she's still carrying on. During World War I, she was actively campaigning for the war to end. And she was um, an organiser for the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. So she was the secretary for the British branch of that, UK branch of that. And over 150 women had been invited from the UK to travel to The Hague where uh, women from across Europe who were from nations at war and nations who were neutral were gathering in order to debate uh, how to put an end to the war. So that was in 1915. So she was the secretary for the British delegation. So that meant she was organised doing all the travel arrangements and getting passports and so on. And in those days, you got passport, one passport, one trip. So the Home Office awarded just 20 passports. And when those 20 women got to Dover to get the ferry, Winston Churchill, first Lord of the Admiralty, had deemed that the shipping lanes should be closed. Um, only time during the war, apparently, when the shipping lanes were, sh were, were shut. Um, <laughs> He called them those dangerous women. <laughs> well, I, for one, am proud of that title. Yeah. Yay. Yay. He trained, as well as trained in general medicine, he trained in medical psychology. So he ended up speaking up for men who were facing court-martial, facing the firing squad at court-martial. And his testimony as to their mental health would determine whether they lived or died. When that ghastly war ended in November 1918, and finally, women over 30, either married or with property, could vote in a December election, Yay! you can understand how fervently we <laughs> Our second daughter, Janet Mary, arrived the following year. <laughs> and when father died in 1921, we decided to move here to Stroud. So having chosen to get married, having chosen to have children, she then, when she can, throws herself into local politics in as clever and astute a way as she can so that she's not impacting on Harold's practice. And it's very clear that she was supporting her, her husband in the development of his business. She was you know, constrained by the domestic and the, and the, and the business interests of a doctor's practice in a market town like Stroud. Especially 
delighted as this year was also the same year where women achieved full franchise. No longer did we have to be 30 years of age, but now 21, as with men. She was really passionate about trying to create a different type of world, being involved in, in things like the League of Nations and, and, and so on. And peace, of course. She was a lifelong pacifist. Public talks were held here in this park, and I was here as president of the Stroud branch of the League of Nations at the first one. In the speech she gave in 1928, that speech was entitled No More War. It is very emotional, very inspiring speech. It is for the common people to let our rulers know that whatever party is in power, we are determined that they should put first of all questions this matter of permanent peace, without which all political ideals are absolutely vain. As women, we should let our determination be that our full enfranchisement will free the world from war. Everything about the, the life of Margaret Hills is relevant because we still have war and we still have illegal wars and we still have unnecessary wars. I just think it was incredible what she achieved because everything that she campaigned for, she got. And most people would work for things and not actually see it in their lifetime. There's a lot to be inspired by knowing about her story. Um, you know, how can we act on behalf of others who are less privileged than us? How can we act on behalf of what's best for our environment? I think it's interesting to learn about the suffrage movement as such, understanding something around democracy, how we cannot take it for granted, but also what are the challenges today. Anyone today, I think we just should be so grateful that we even got the vote. I mean, I think you know, my own grandmother couldn't vote. That's only two generations away. A, a woman who wasn't born here but moved to the town really uh, courageously worked and worked to bring so many positive changes that we can still see and we can still enjoy. So in terms of her legacy, you'll find references to that in the wiki page as well as her life. But the places, the places and spaces around Stroud are Lansdowne Road Library. She and her husband were responsible for setting up the first infant welfare centre. Social housing on Summer Street. That's thanks to Margaret. And Chas Turnley made sure that there's a now a new housing development for older people that's named Margaret House Close. And she was involved in schools as well. Archway School, for example, was built to replace a school called Robra County Secondary School. But I think the big one is Stratford Park. We have Stratford Park. We all love going to Stratford Park because the outdoor pool, the ball's green. And my family were very involved with Stratford Park. My granddad, um, from the Second World War, at the well, end of the Second World War, till he retired, he, he worked at the park and he still played bowls right until he died. So I, I kind of have this strong feeling that they may have met. I'd like to think so because even though she wasn't on the council by then, she was very instrumental in purchasing the park and also implementing that the bowling green was, would be built and the outdoor pool. So I, I kind of think that she might like to go on there and he, he would have been well known in Stroud. That's just one of the many coincidences I have with her really. What was amazing about the performance was I've never written a script before and hearing the words I'd written being performed and listened to by, I don't know, upwards of 150 people. I was really grateful for that opportunity to be able to tell the story about this amazing woman that we didn't know much about before. And I know that for Gemma, she's now, she now passes big decisions past Margaret before she makes them. Even 
nearly a hundred years later, Margaret's advice would still be relevant to me, so I ask her for it. And she gives it freely. <laughs> Pilgrim, uh, which was the National Union of Women's Suffrage Society's weekly, weekly publication. Um, and Pilgrim was obviously very taken with Margaret. And this is dated September the 26, 1913, and is headed The Woman in Charge. There are several Margarets of fame in the labour world. There's Margaret Macmillan and Margaret Bonfield and Margaret Llewellyn Davis. But there is our Margaret also. Margaret Robertson, captain of our Election Fighting Fund forces. When the Election Fighting Fund was formed and the new election policy defined, there was no doubt in anybody's mind as to the right person to take charge of the work. The hour had come and the woman. Margaret Robertson was asked to take charge and so accepted without delay. What is she like? This leader of a brilliant staff of workers. Margaret Robertson has all the qualities needed for her responsible and difficult post, but absolute fearlessness, not only in action, but in thought, is the one that strikes you most. 